In Vietnam, some 100,000 refugees from the Central Highlands alone have been on the road for a week now, often caught in crossfires as they try to reach government-held areas along the coast. They are hungry, but the best the government can do is drop them supplies along the route. Every day they face death as North Vietnamese and Viet Cong forces launch shelling and ground attacks on this mass of humanity. While refugees from the highlands seek safety, others are marching from the south toward Da Nang, racing from the approaching enemy, from the relentless communist drive for more government-held territory. Bruce Dunning has more on the story. The Hai Van Pass is the last barrier which the refugees must cross before they reach Da Nang. Cruelly, it comes almost at the end of their journey from Quang Tri or Hue to Da Nang. These people have traveled 60 miles or more, thousands of them making the journey on foot, only to be faced with the zigzag curves and steep grades in these mountains beside the sea. The communist forces have closed this road many times, almost at will. But for more than a week, they haven't cut this only escape route, allowing the refugees to escape until this particular day. About halfway between Da Nang and Hue, snipers opened fire on a military truck carrying refugees. CBS News cameraman Vin Vey was trying to reach his home in Hue when he arrived at this point shortly after the sniper attack. Soldiers were helping the wounded who remained. Other refugees had scattered. Those who made it through resumed their journey. But there is fear now that the communist forces may be moving in on this road to close it permanently as they maneuver into position for an attack on Hue. People in Da Nang are afraid because the North Vietnamese are also moving closer south of the city. 35 miles south of Da Nang, Tam Ki is threatened, and here too people are fleeing. The communist-led troops overran a government battalion about six miles west of the city. The government soldiers scattered. The battalion virtually wiped out as a fighting unit. A few soldiers straggle back, but the government must commit a new battalion to hold the government lines which are now a mile or so closer to Tam Ki. To lose Tam Ki in Quang Tin province would give the communists complete control all the way across the narrow coastal lowlands to the sea, and it would help tighten the noose around Da Nang. Bruce Dunning, CBS News, Da Nang. The Viet Cong today appealed for aid from other nations to help feed the million South Vietnamese who have come under VC rule in the Central Highlands this month. That appeal was published in a Japanese communist newspaper. At the Phnom Penh airport today, government troops gave up two more defense positions as enemy rocket attacks continued to paralyze the U.S. airlift operation. Two American planes hit yesterday were repaired and flown out today. No word on when the airlift will be resumed for the surrounded capital.
News headquarters in New York. This is the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite and Bruce Dunning in Saigon, Peter Collins in Saigon, Richard Threlkeld near Phnom Penh, Bob Simon in London, Randy Daniels in Chicago, Bernard Goldberg in Miami Beach, in Washington Ike Pappas, Phil Jones, and Daniel Shore. Good evening. Communist forces in South Vietnam have captured another province, their 12th, Lam Dong, after a two-hour battle that reportedly took government troops by surprise, the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong there moved into the provincial capital of Bao Lot, just 90 miles northeast of Saigon. This gives the communists control of about half of South Vietnam's territory and a good position from which to launch a drive south to the coast. Communists also captured the provincial capital of Hoi An, 15 miles south of Da Nang, heightening chances of that city's capture soon. Chaos is reported in Da Nang as hundreds of thousands of refugees fight to get out. The U.S. consulate was forced to shut down today. Martial law was declared. A 24-hour curfew was ordered. And soldiers were told to shoot to kill anyone causing disturbances. So panicked were refugees trying to flee the city that they rioted at the Da Nang airport, forcing the U.S.-sponsored air rescue to be suspended for the day. Ed Daly, president of World Airways, which is operating that airlift, told Bruce Dunning what happened. We finally, after beating them off, literally, the crew members and others, I, when I say they, I refer to the refugees, uh, we um, only had 137 passengers on board, but we started the engines, used that as a means of getting the back ramp up, which we were using for loading. And um, as we were taxiing down for takeoff, we saw a group of approximately 100, 100 South Vietnamese refugees out of Da Nang running towards the aircraft. The captain, Jim McDaniel, decided that he had more than adequate space. He stopped, lowered the ramp, and just prior to this first group arriving, from behind another building, there was a swarm of an estimated several hundred people. It was obvious that we would never have gotten off the ground. Their lives, the crew's lives were endangered. The aircraft was endangered. He immediately closed the door as he should have, or rather, the sensible thing to do, and he did it, good judgment on his part, and took off. U.S. Army Chief of Staff General Frederick Wyand met in Saigon today with South Vietnamese President Chu. Wyan, the last American commander in Vietnam, is back there at President Ford's request to assess the military situation and determine what additional American help might be needed. Most urgent of the Saigon government's many worries right now is holding on to Da Nang, a task growing more and more difficult. Ike Pappas reports. Defense analysts now feel there is little hope of saving the city of Da Nang. They point out that the North Vietnamese have up to four divisions pressing in on the city and that the South Vietnamese defenders are greatly outnumbered. One analyst said that the city could fall within two to three weeks. At the same time, Pentagon sources estimated between 20 and 30,000 South Vietnamese soldiers deserted their units during the recent retreat, crippling at least three South Vietnamese divisions. The sources said the South Vietnamese have also either destroyed or abandoned tens of millions of dollars worth of American military equipment thus far in the retreat. At the same time, the administration has been pressing Congress for $300 million more in emergency military aid. Congress approved $700 million in military aid for South Vietnam this fiscal year. Of that, $525 million has either been shipped or is being readied for shipment. The remainder, $175 million, will be committed by next week. 
A government report shows the United States is already spending nearly twice as much money to support South Vietnam's armed forces as the communists are spending in military aid to North Vietnam. America's 700 million to an estimated 400 million by the communists. But the Pentagon is quick to point out that the majority of our aid is in things like fuel, spare parts, and training, and the majority of the communists' aid is in weapons and in ammunition. Ike Pappas, CBS News, the Pentagon. Earlier this month, the Pentagon said it had found that Cambodia had been overcharged $21.5 million for military aid last year. Well, today, the government's general accounting office said the Defense Department used... On the CBS Morning News, 13 minutes before the hour. One of the many things the U.S. military tried without much success to win the war in Vietnam was the use of chemical defoliants to deny the jungle to the enemy. As a tactic, defoliation never did much harm to the Viet Cong's military capabilities, but it may have done us a lot more harm than we ever suspected. Station WBBM-TV in Chicago has been spending the last year investigating the long-term effects on American soldiers exposed to the defoliants, and Bill Curtis sums up what that investigation found. Agent Orange was a defoliant, one of those new weapons of war supposed to turn the tide in Vietnam. It was sprayed over five million acres of South Vietnam from 1962 to 1970, destroying millions of acres of timber. Its use was restricted in 1970 because tests showed the ingredients in Agent Orange caused birth defects in laboratory animals. And indeed, reports filtered out of Vietnam that civilians were being affected as well. The Viet Cong charged the defoliant was causing the birth of deformed children. In this country, Congress commissioned the National Academy of Sciences to study the claims. They traveled to Vietnam in 1971, but they could not find any evidence linking the herbicide spraying with human problems. The Vietnamese reports were dismissed as propaganda. The matter was forgotten. Until this year, when more than 40 cases were filed by Americans who served in Vietnam, filed with the Veterans Administration, claiming symptoms related to Agent Orange. The symptoms are similar to those reported by other known exposures to dioxin, a lethal ingredient in Agent Orange. Among the symptoms, veterans complain of numbness in the fingers and toes. Michael Adams was exposed when he saw combat in the Mekong Delta. They feel like they're not there at all, you know, like there's no blood in it or something, and I have to... This scares me because I have to really find out if it's there. Other symptoms range from cancer, to weight loss, to birth defects. Richard Ross was born without the tips of his fingers. His leg is banded with a congenital defect. Richard was born in 1971, after his father returned from serving with a special forces unit in Vietnam. He has a few manual dexterity problems, you know, of course, because of his deformities, but other than that, he's a normal six-year-old. The Veterans Administration has denied most of the claims, saying there isn't enough scientific evidence, citing views like those of Air Force Captain Alvin Young, who headed a group that disposed of Agent Orange and who conducted his own investigation of the defoliant. I don't think that there's any supportive evidence. You must remember that the only real supportive evidence that's of accusations where there's been information has been by North Vietnamese scientists. And even there, Dr. Tung, one of the primary investigators, has indicated that he really wasn't able to get a good study of the people that he investigated, where he found what he thought were liver carcinomas. But the weight of other scientific studies in the last few years contradicts Captain Young. Dr. James Allen of the Wisconsin School of Medicine has established toxic effects of dioxin by feeding extremely small amounts to eight rhesus monkeys over a nine-month period. Five died after developing symptoms of skin rash, growths on their extremities that turned into gangrene. Low-level exposure may not produce obvious effects today or tomorrow. It may be 10 years, it may be 20 years. Thus, you may be exposed to the compounds and suffer no ill effects, but you may have damage done that will manifest itself years and years later. Now we're talking about the possibilities of cancer, the possibilities of mutagenic effects. Could low-level doses of Agent Orange containing dioxin have affected the Vietnam veterans producing symptoms these 10 years later? Dr. Barry Commoner of Washington University in St. Louis, who has studied the effects of dioxin, thinks it could. It may well be true 
that soldiers who were in vet Vietnam uh, were exposed to dioxin, which accumulated in their fat with no symptoms, uh, perhaps uh, except for the immediate, let's say, skin symptoms when they were first exposed. Then, let's say 10 years later, uh, they become sick and lose weight and break down their fat, releasing the dioxin into the body, and symptoms appear. Dr. Commoner, along with other leading dioxin scientists, feels immediate testing should begin, similar to the studies now being run on World War II veterans who witnessed atomic tests. It becomes just one of many so-called final chapters of the Vietnam War, and if the claims have validity, the memories of Vietnam will be around for a long, long time. Bill Curtis for CBS News, Chicago. Exactly eight minutes before the hour, Richard Threlkel and Leslie Stahl will be right back. A gallon, those who oppose it say buy 10 cents a gallon. Hughes? In South Vietnam, anti-government forces are still on the offensive, and the counter-offensive promised by President Chu does not seem to be developing. North Vietnamese and Viet Cong units are attacking at several points along the central coast in Binh Dinh province, and Saigon has lost radio contact with one district capital there. At Da Nang on the coast, the situation is chaotic and misery is commonplace. Hundreds of thousands of refugees have poured into the city from the fighting zones, many of them arriving by boat from Hue. Families have become separated, soldiers who've lost their units or deserted are mixed in with the civilians. Boat captains are charging small fortunes to take people out of Da Nang to other parts, points farther south because Da Nang itself is now cut off by road. Enemy units are across the highway nets north and south of the city. The United States and the South Vietnamese are running an airlift out of Da Nang, but so far it doesn't amount to much despite talk of flying thousands out every day. A big 747 jetliner capable of carrying about a thousand passengers is supposed to be put on the run in a few days, but at the moment only one 727 is in use, handling around 200 passengers at a time. In Cambodia, the insurgents are now firing captured 105 millimeter howitzers at the Phnom Penh airport. Those guns are much more accurate than the rockets the insurgents have been this using. This is the providing. CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. And in Washington, Eric Severide, Ike Pappas, Fred Graham, Bruce Dunning in Saigon, Peter Collins in Saigon, Ed Bradley in Phnom Penh, Phil Jones in Bakersfield, California, Robert Pierpoint in Sacramento, and Randy Daniels in Hamilton, Ohio. Good evening. From South Vietnam today, more stories that can be described only as indescribable. Reporters and photographers are catching some of it, but the full scope of what is going on there probably is beyond words and cameras. The weekend horror of government soldiers brutally fighting to escape the Nang on the now stopped U.S. airlift has taken on new dimensions. With almost one and a half million persons trapped in Da Nang, thousands scrambled to escape on the U.S. sea rescue. But that, too, has been ordered halted because of communist shelling. Many drowned trying to get to those evacuation ships, and today, bloated bodies floated into Nang's harbor. Others lucky enough to get on barges died of exposure before reaching the ships. There are stories of marauding government troops battling over small boats and barges that would take them to the ships. And aboard one of the ships, the pioneer commander, a report that South Vietnamese Marines killed 25 persons they claimed were Viet Cong suspects. And there are stories of government soldiers seizing control of evacuation ships, of soldiers raping, robbing, beating refugees. Bruce Dunning reports now on the evacuation effort. The first ship to bring refugees into the port city of Nha Trang was the cargo ship Andrew Miller. It was loaded with hundreds of civilians and also soldiers whose units were broken up as they fled from the North Vietnamese. Some refugees refused to disembark from a Vietnamese Navy ship that brought them from Da Nang. They didn't want to be left here in Nha Trang. These people may have fled from other cities into Da Nang, only to find they had to flee again. They want the ship to take them to Saigon, but the government is trying to limit the number of refugees being allowed into the capital for fear that the communist supper squads could be infiltrated into Saigon among the refugees. 
But no one feels secure in Nha Trang, and thousands are trying to flee the city. If they can't get out by ship, they are taking to the roads, heading to Phan Thiet, the next major city southward, as the wave of refugees rolls on, pushed by the onrushing North Vietnamese advance and the government retreat. Those who remain are filling sandbags to build bunkers for protection against the attack they fear will come, unless the government concedes Nha Trang, as it has conceded more than a third of the country. Bruce Denning, CBS News, Saigon. The U.S. Agency for International Development says tomorrow it will begin a new evacuation of refugees, this time from the port city of Kinong, South Vietnam's third largest city. But there were unconfirmed reports today that the communists already had captured Kinong in their drive south along the coast. Further south, civil disorder was reported in Nha Trang, a city swollen by refugees and a target of the communist offensive. Along the Cambodian border, communists also are threatening Tainan province, crucial in their campaign because of its proximity to Saigon. Peter Collins reports. These South Vietnamese troops and tanks are reinforcements being moved into the threatened city of Tainan, 50 miles northwest of Saigon. They are facing one of the biggest and perhaps most decisive battles of the war if, as expected, the North Vietnamese attack Tainan and the area north of Saigon in the weeks ahead. In Tainang itself, most of the shops along the main street are closed, and the marketplace is deserted. Only a few people, like this helpless old woman, are left behind out of a population of about 50,000. Gas stations in Tainang are closed, but a few young girls, brave enough to ignore the threat of occasional rocket attacks, still find customers for black market gasoline they sell in plastic cans. The soldiers charged with defending Taining are part of the 25th Infantry Division, and their veteran commander, Brigadier General Li Tong Ba, has some strong views about the collapse of South Vietnamese forces in the central and northern provinces. It is a question of leadership, he says. The commander must be up front with his troops. General Ba often digs into his own pocket for money to buy beer for soldiers such as these, just back from a combat operation but it will take more than confidence and leadership to hold Taining. Near Bien Hoa, 15 miles north of the capital, a bulldozer has been put to work digging a trench that the soldiers hope will be wide and deep enough to stop the Russian-made T-54 tanks. But with the North Vietnamese offensive in high gear, there is serious doubt whether tank trenches will be enough to stop their advance. Peter Collins, CBS News, Saigon. Mike Pappas reports from the Pentagon that officials there are taking another look at South Vietnam's military situation, and what they see is grimmer than they'd thought. Pentagon figures show the refugee situation in South Vietnam is worse than previously believed. As many as 1,750,000 people are homeless, and Pentagon sources say the figure could go to 2 million. They offer this breakdown. 1,300,000 are now in Da Nang. Another 400,000 are safe, at least for the time being, in the cities of Nat Trang, Tuiwa, and Quignon. Another 20,000 are straggling along coastal roads. And today, Defense Secretary Schlesinger said that the military situation in South Vietnam was grim. He predicted that the North Vietnamese would attack Saigon itself in a matter of weeks. The Da Nang is now gone, and uh, undoubtedly there will be further withdrawals. The government must stabilize a, a defensive line that incorporates at least Saigon and the Delta. And uh, undoubtedly the morale of the remaining forces has been adversely affected. At the present time, however, one doesn't know how much the demoralization that occurred in the north may affect the forces in the south, and what? that will have to be tested. I fear that uh, Hanoi will now move rap as rapidly as possible to test that. Schlesinger said fleeing South Vietnamese troops left behind at least $600 million worth of U.S. military equipment, and the figure could go to a billion dollars before the final accounting is in. Ike Pappas, CBS News, the Pentagon. Some American dependents in Saigon reportedly are being evacuated from that city, but the State Department in Washington says it has not ordered any evacuation. The communist advance has prompted the United States, though, to remove highly radioactive fuel from an American-supplied reactor in Da Lop in South Vietnam's southern highlands. The Viet Cong today offered to hold peace talks with a new Saigon government, one that stands for, quote, 
peace, independence, and strict application of the Paris Accords. The statement was broadcast by Hanoi Radio. This is my wife, and I love her. I love her a lot. And I'll tell you one big reason why. She thinks enough of herself to take really good care of herself. Well, I just don't think you should let yourself go. So I eat right, exercise, and I take Geritol every day. That way I know I get the iron and vitamins I need. Geritol, more than twice the iron of any ordinary supplement and some very important vitamins. My wife, she cares about herself, and I love her for it. You'd never think that people who live out here where the days are filled with hard work, fresh air and sunshine, and nights are quiet, would sometimes have trouble falling asleep, but they do. Sure, I have trouble falling asleep once in a while. Everyone does. So I take Somonix. I put in a full day. What I don't need is trouble falling asleep at night. So I keep Somonix in the house. Somonix? It helps me relax and feel drowsy so I get to sleep. Somonix. It helps take the trouble out of falling asleep. Cambodia's President Marshall Lon No was leaving his country, presumably never to return. Publicly, the trip, expected to begin within 24 hours, is said to be for a state visit to Indonesia and then to the United States for health reasons. Ed Bradley reports from Phnom Penh. Traffic at the palace has been heavy with a stream of high-ranking visitors. U.S. Ambassador John Gunther Dean met with the marshal and informed sources say at this point the United States is making no effort to keep Lon Nol at the top of this crumbling republic. Top Khmer officials, military leaders, and the remaining province chiefs have visited to say their farewells. Sources in this government say no one expects the marshal to return. His personal belongings have been packed, including the birds he kept on the palace grounds. His family and a group of about 25 others have received their passports and visas. The marshal also presided at a last-minute promotion ceremony, raising a couple of old friends to the rank of general and transferring choice assignments to some of those old friends who will remain in Cambodia. The president, a devout Buddhist, also met the religious traditions of his office in a farewell meal with the leading monks. It is traditional for a new or departing chief of state to eat with the spiritual leaders of this country. And Lon Nol had an emotional breakfast with the monks, including two who ate with him five years ago after the ouster of Prince Sihanouk. Palace sources said he gave the monks about $3,000 and tearfully told them it was his final goodbye. The departure of Lon Nol signals the beginning of the end of the war. The president met with his cabinet, and it's expected a caretaker government will be formed ostensibly to call new elections. But the new government is expected to last only a matter of days before another is formed, a new group that will attempt to negotiate with the Khmer Rouge. There is talk here of a negotiated settlement. That will depend on the Khmer Rouge. Militarily, they have the upper hand, and with the departure of Lan Nol, they are the strongest political force as well. After five years of war, the Khmer Rouge will be able to dictate their terms for peace. Ed Bradley, CBS News, Phnom Penh.